at the, in Myrtle Beach at the Smear Center this year. After the first of these sessions, Wendy Connor uh, came up to me and said that Meher Baba had told her mother, Jane, that Stay With God would transform the world. And uh, I, it's a book that I th can believe will be of colossal importance. Um, so th this will be, six, these sessions this weekend and uh, next will be on this subject. Uh, I'd like to start actually by reading a little bit from the, the poem, it's called the opening stanzas. We'll be coming back to it this afternoon. Uh, here's a picture of Francis on the Andre tour 1954 with Baba. But the opening stand, yeah, here's a copy. This is Michael LePage's copy, signed by Baba. Baba actually signed the book uh, like this for a number of people. These are the opening lines, which I'd like to read out. It's quite a magnificent opening. I hope you can read those of you. Can you read, Rosie? Is it good? If you can't, well, that's just too bad because I can't make it any bigger. Okay. Wings toward the glaciers of Kailas, where the first fathers nourished the seed of God, and Shiva gentled Ganga, and Parvati walked by streams of living heart. For Shiva was Jesus before him, and Parvati his loveliness in the earth, as was Rama, as was Krishna, as was Abraham and Zarathustra and Buddha and Muhammad in, in their loveliness, God's avatar, as is now Baba. Sing, Baba, your descent this time on earth, your brightness in our night, your comfort in our separation. For it is my love's desiring, Baba, to compose a book on this theme which you set me. And to this task, my spirit spreads its wings only to fall stifled and overcome, the song groaning within my breast, impossible of utterance. For only a perfect master can speak a book, and saintship is the least qualification to sing of you, although a profound scholarship is sufficient for the assembling of mere facts. But I have neither devotion nor learning for the task. In the past, you had Vyasa and Homer and Valmiki and many others who were your name and yourself to leave your name in impassioned imprisonment of words, and saints innumerable who picked up the threads of your name's loveliness and wove them into bright patterned verses. Only if you, Baba, sustain my flight, give knowledge to my intellect, and unbind the empathy of my heart, can this work be done. Not miracle, but faith. Faith that is grace, and grace your miracle. So those are the opening three stanzas of what is really um, an epic. Francis Brabazon composed an epic uh, for this advent. <clears throat> Here, I wrote uh, an introductory um, uh, essay, which uh, at, for, actually for avatars about. I'd like to read out a lot of this because I think that this would be in a uh, uh, coming approaching stay with that. How many people here have read it, in fact? Okay, if you have. Um, this doesn't presuppose uh, a knowledge uh, of the poem these, these sessions are having here. So let me read out uh, most of this. Composed at Meher Baba's directive, read out to him several times, and incorporating Baba's own additions and corrections, Francis Brabazon's Stay With God stands alone in the Meher Baba Library as a presentation without parallel of who the God-man is and the significance of his avataric advent. Sweeping in what it undertakes and supremely beautiful in its poetry, Francis's epic masterpiece 
lays a major foundation for the culture of the new humanity in the age to come. Indeed, Mihir Baba himself said that it was second in importance only to God Speaks. Over the four days of this program, we will begin to unpack some of the dazzling riches of this multidimensional epic treasure palace. The poem is divided into five sections or books. If you look at the table of inter uh, contents, you'll see book one, book two, book three, so forth. The first, a biographical narrative of Baba's life through the Maribad Sahavas of 1955. That's when Fr uh, Baba gave Francis the order to write this book was at the Maribad Sahavas in that year, November of that year. The second, a love poem. The third, a poetic retelling of the divine theme in God Speaks. The fourth, a meditation on the turning that brings one to the threshold of the spiritual path and the feet of the perfect master. And the last, a sweeping survey of the cultural and spiritual history of the world, replete with commentary and criticism, as Francis proclaims and celebrates the descent of the God-man and the role that he plays age after age. Much of the program will be devoted to tracing. No, I, I actually, let me get something else here. This is a... Uh, says some things that, okay. Okay, I'm gonna read some. I actually pulled up a, a different description. Okay, so Stay With God was undertaken by Francis in response to an order given to him by Baba at the men's Sahavas program in Maribad in 1955. Though the Sahavas was intended for Baba's Indian followers, Francis and Don Stevens, two Westerners, were specially invited to stay on through the four one-week sessions that Baba had organized for lovers of his from four Indian language groups. At the end of that time, uh, Baba directed Don to write and compile what was published in 1957 as Listen to Humanity, while Francis got ordered to compose Stay with God, a title given to him by Baba himself. Back in Australia, Francis conceived the idea of composing this work in poetic form. The actual writing took him several years, during which time Baba visited Australia twice, in 1956 and 1958. While at length, when at length Francis arrived in India to join Baba as one of his resident Mandali in early 1959, a year after Baba's inaugural visit to Avatar's abode. You know, you've heard of Avatar's abode, right? Uh, the center at, uh, in Australia created. Francis is kind of the father of Avatar's abode, you might say. Um, he brought the manuscript with him. Baba had it read out three times. And beyond these simple readings, Baba personally went over its text closely, making corrections, giving new material, and directing Francis to incorporate new elements and features, such as the philosophical foundations section <clears throat> and extensive notes, which help guide readers to the maze of references that saturate the main text. The back, uh, there are, some of you may have, who have read the book or have looked at it, there are all these uh, textual notes explaining who some of the people are he refers to. So this was composed at Baba's own uh, d directive. Rarely in his life did Baba involve himself in a lover's or disciple's literary endeavor to such an extent. Indeed, though the hand that wrote was Francis's, one can truly say that the book is Baba's from A to Z. And while Baba would often encourage the efforts of his lovers with praise and commendation, the praise which Baba bestowed upon Stay With God was of no common order and must surely be construed as an indication of the book's future importance. According to Baba's own Mera in letters that she wrote to Diane Dimfel during this period, we have never before seen Baba so enthusiastic. Baba says this book is a masterpiece. It is so beautifully written. To quote Baba, he who will read this book will have read everything and in no avataric period has a book been written about the avatar to be read by the avatar himself. 
Francis himself wrote in a letter in 1960, I think the highest praise that Baba gave Stay With God was, it will appeal to the highest intellect, to those with simple hearts. Really does have both head and heart. An expression of both head and heart. And when the book was released by Edwin and Shaw for Garuda Books in Australia late in 1959, Baba asked that it be distributed as widely as possible and expressed the wish that every family own a copy. Stay with God has come to stay, Baba declared. The love will touch the heart of all who read it, as no book has ever done. So clearly, Baba would sometimes uh, shower his lovers with praise when they did something for him. But clearly, what Baba was saying about Stay with God is beyond that. Um, and I say a lot more about this, and this I won't actually go to read this, but I think that part of the importance of Stay with God um, is going to come into view uh, now, more than until now. And uh, the reason, to my mind, is this. Um, we're, you know, the, we've what is it, 45, 46 years since the Advent came to an end. Um, the uh, Mihir Baba's worldwide following, his family, uh, has been living to a good extent under the guidance and inspiration of his disciples. Even, you know, in places where there weren't any living disciples uh, in recent years, they kind of gave an example and uh, that we tended to follow, I feel. Uh, and the regime, so to speak, has been largely determined by the style that they set, carrying it on from Meher Baba's own time. Uh, and that was uh, a great treasure that was bestowed upon humanity through his disciples. They're gone now. That era is over. And, um, but the advent isn't over, and love for God isn't over, and Meher Baba isn't over. So it's now the time for his lovers to find uh, uh, their own, uh, in a new way, approaches to him, at least so it seems to me. And um, one big part of that, to my mind, is actually consciously creating a culture uh, directly based on the advent. Now, it's not that we haven't been doing that until now. That, that isn't so. But I do think it's going to emerge in a more um, explicit way. Uh, and we'll have to be making conscious decisions and finding a direction with more awareness and without parent figures to guide us. I remember when I was in, um, first moved to Maribad, I would be part of the birthday play that was done every February 25th. And uh, I, from time to, <laughs> time to time questions would come up and I would hear, you know, Alan or Heather uh, who were, you know, writing the play to say, oh, no, 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 Mani would never like that. Okay. Well, uh, when you've got the likes of Amani there or an Erich, I, I'm on board with that. That's the way to go. But the truth is that that never was the real reason for doing something or not doing something. The real reason is because it pleases Baba or doesn't. And when you have his own mandali, um, we'll take advantage of the guidance that they can give. But the fact is we need to do it ourselves. Well, so now we, we're in a situation like if somebody... Um, on cultural matters, wanted to come to uh, Mirabeau here and said, um, well, you know, William Shakespeare is a very great playwright poet. I would like to put a, on a play of Shakespeare, of Hamlet, Mirabeau. So what would you say? Or, you know, I mean, it's sort of difficult, isn't it? Or maybe it's not difficult, but there might be some people who would really say, of course, it expresses spiritual truth. And others would say, what does this have to do with Baba, as we're not praising or knocking Baba? Or let's say a symphony by Mozart, you know. I'm kind of bringing up, uh, you know, we're going to have to find our own way of what suits um, the, the, the culture that we're building and what doesn't. And uh, I imagine every center 
every group, each person will have to find their own way through this. We can't just go run to Mani and say, Mani, he wants, he wants us to do Hamlet, should we do Hamlet? Well, that option isn't there, you know. So what do we do and what don't we do? Well, I feel that part of the importance of state God is that Francis was explicitly addressing that in a in way that no one else among Meher Baba's Mandali did. That's, especially in the fifth book of Stay With God, that you might say was Francis's work, or a big part of his work uh, for Baba. Um, he was, do you know the word autodidact? He self-learned. Yeah. He had education up to the age of 11 or 12 at all. He was a farmer, farmer's kid. And he somehow managed to uh, acquire a ter- tremendous knowledge of world culture and world art and spirituality. He was quite amazing. Guy. Any of you meet him? Any of you meet Francis? I didn't either. Um, and it was part of his work for Baba, actually. Baba gave him a platform uh, to um, talk about these things and give his opinion. He's a very opinionated guy. If you, those of you who read with State of God um, would certainly see this. He, if he doesn't like someone, he'll just trash them. And it, he, and, and it doesn't matter, like some of the people, he takes a lot of people to the woodshed and gives them real thrashing. And some of those who get taken to the woodshed would include, for example, Michelangelo or William Shakespeare or Ludwig van Beethoven. I mean, he doesn't hesitate to do after anybody. And um, part of what, I mean, whether you agree with his opinions on those particular people or not, Part of what I think really is of guiding value to us, this is just my own opinion. I'm trying to express what I think is part of the significance of Stay With God. But it really will be for Baba's lovers and Baba's family to build a culture based on him. And we should be quite fearless about it. And what really serves that purpose we should take and what does not serve that purpose we should reject. And uh, how to do that, I think that Stay With God really is a great illuminating beacon because um, apart from what Francis's particular opinions may have been on this subject or on that, which are always interesting, but the discrimination and groundedness in Meher Baba that he uh, brings to bear on it will help us enormously. So when you know Baba said to Jane Haynes, a state with God will transform the world. I can see it. I really can see it because we'll need to. How do we deal? What kind of a world? What kind of a culture? I mean, I imagine at Mirabod you must have had to deal with all kinds of stuff. Or if you don't, you will. Somebody, well, I'm into this. And that, well, there are probably new, new things that you haven't conceived of yet. I'm sure there are. But I, I'm into Baba and this is my work and I want to do it because it's Baba's. So, well, do you or don't you, you know? Um, it, you know, it's not easy. It's, uh, these aren't easy choices. There's a deep inner searching, not just, not to question whether the, the person is sincerely doing that for Baba, but apart from that, does this, should this really be part of the culture that we build on him, you know? And uh, every culture does it differently. You have great uniqueness, great creativity, but the inner rootedness and inner truth um, is the essential thing. So I think that Stay With God will be of tremendous illuminating value uh, to the Baba world in this. And I kind of think it's time is coming now, more than in the past, even though many people have read it with great appreciation and understanding over the years. But I think it's really coming, going to start to come into its own in the period that we're coming into. Now, the, uh, those of you who have been to any of these sessions before uh, will, will know that you're very invited and, uh, and very welcome to speak up as we proceed. And if you've got questions or points you want to uh, raise, uh, Please do. Don't hesitate. It won't, for me, just to be, you know, shooting off at the mouth, you know, for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon, will 
uh, become immensely tiresome. So uh, take part. Don't hesitate. And if you, you know, if you don't know with God, or uh, don't don't be bashful, you know, about asking stupid questions. Stupid questions are so often um, questions that everybody else would really like to ask, but is too too shy to do. Okay, so take part as you as you feel prompted to do. And the uh, this is how. I've organized these sessions. Oops, where did I put it? Sorry. Yeah. So this morning is going to be. I can't expand this, unfortunately. I don't know. I don't know if you can can read it. Okay. This morning we'll just will be pretty well introductory to Francis Brabazon himself. So an introduction to Stay With God, its author, textual history, and organization. Um, a preview of the program. The vision of Stay With God and its possible significance as a tool in Mirabhava's work for humanity. The life and literary oeuvre, that's the work, literary work, Francis Brabazon. The making of the book, a literary history of Stay With God, and the organization of Stay With God, a survey of the book, and its parts. So this will be kind of giving a picture of uh, overview uh, of Stay With God. Um, okay, I have a lot of many, oh, we'll get to these things presently. This afternoon, Stay With God is divided into five books, right? So the, uh, the first one is a biography of Meher Baba through 1955. And, uh, of course, that's when Baba gave him the order to write the book, so he didn't attempt to carry his biography beyond that point. But let me just say now uh, that that year, the, the, I think that year is a significant one, um, Meher Baba had concluded his new life in 1952. And uh, in the new life, the avatar of the age became a seeker, an ordinary seeker of God. Uh, he set aside godhood and uh, became an ordinary man, so to speak. With the conclusion of the new life, Baba resumed his old life status, and that culminated in 1954 February with his declaring himself publicly to be the avatar of the age. So just the year before, this order to Francis, Baba had presented himself as the avatar. But some of his disciples knew that already, to tell the truth, even in the earlier years. Uh, even in 1931, Baba told his West, some of his Western followers that he was the Christ. But he hadn't done so publicly. But at this point, he did. So this is very much a um, proclamation of the avatar of the age. It's an epic of the avatar. Um, and in November of 1955, um, it, it, Baba held this sahavas at Marabad, uh, where he called four, over four weeks four groups of his lovers from India. Uh, and it wasn't to be a darshan, Baba said. Uh, he had given a lot of very large-scale darshans in 52, 53, 54. You know, a darshan is where a, a spiritual master presents himself to the world, and sometimes 10, 50, almost 100,000 people would come and, uh, you know, get his prasad and bow at his feet, and he would give some sort of message. It was kind of like a public bestowal of blessings and presence on the part of the master. Baba had done a lot of that over those two or three years. The 55 Sahavas was not that. It definitely was not. Baba wanted it to be Sahavas, which was uh, the company, the intimate company and presence uh, of, the, uh, of him as the divine beloved. He was the avatar of the age, but he was showing himself to, the, uh, to this group as the beloved with intimate exchange between lover and beloved. Okay, so Francis and Don Stevens were the two Westerners who were allowed to take part in that. 
at the, at the same time, exactly the very same month, November 1955, God Speaks was published. And God Speaks is exactly the opposite. It's the impersonal God. It's God, the universe, the creator, sustainer, dissolver of the universe. Um, those of you acquainted with God Speaks, I imagine most of you have probably you know, read it or but it heads with it from time to time. Uh, it has almost nothing to say about love. Uh, it's the God creating, sustaining, destroying the universe and the journey of the soul through the universe, all of that. So at the same historical moment, we have a, a, a co-arising, an appearance of Baba in his most personal aspect and in his most impersonal aspect. Do you see what I mean? So it's sort of like both sides showed themselves right then. This is directly mirrored in the structure of Stay With God, as we'll see. So I think this historical moment that Baba gave this order to Francis and also gave the order to Don Stevens to do this in humanity um, was a special one and a distinctly significant one. And it's central to the whole structure of the book. So the book one then, which is an epic biography, and it is an epic We'll say more about that presently, um, is covering this period up through 1955. So I wanted to look this at, okay, I won't go through this in detail. We'll look at this this afternoon. Um, tomorrow morning is uh, book two, um, which is The Love Song of John Kerry. Um, uh, tomorrow afternoon is book three, which is uh, uh, a poetic retelling of God Speaks. Um, it's, uh, okay, I'll show, go over the table of contents in a minute and say a little more about this. And um, next week, I have this wrong. It's actually, this um, will be shuffled. This will be a, a concert, musical concert here with uh, myself and Greg, Gay and Elaine and Brendan okay, taking part. But we'll be looking at uh, book at the, at the rest of Stay With God. Um, the last two sessions devoted to book five, which is um, more than half the poem is book five. And it's a vast uh, survey, I don't know how to describe it, of world culture, world history, um, and art in particular. And it's a, um, a retruing of art and culture God, you might say. He's crit critiquing the history of art and um, proclaiming what it means to stay with God uh, in the art and culture and human life. It's quite a, uh, a huge um, intellectual, artistic undertaking. Anybody interested in art in the Meher Baba's world, this is uh, really the go-to place, um, I think. It's the... In its totality, this is a kind of book that I have a hard time imagining anyone else will replicate for hundreds of years. You know, in the, I don't know, in the Christian civilization, let's say, a magnificent poetic achievement like this might be Dante's Divine Comedy, you know, or something like that. You don't get these very often. And I think Baba has arranged that we already have something on that order uh, in uh, Stay With God. And I don't imagine it will be equaled for a long, long time. So that's, those are a few words in uh, general introduction to Stay With God. Anybody want to bring up anything at this point? Okay. Um, I'm thinking, um, since most of you hadn't read, I won't say too much about this, but um, one aspect of Stay With God uh, that is some people have difficulty with, I wanted to speak to that. For a minute. Let's see. Is this the other one? Okay. 
Sorry, I'll have this in a minute. Here we go. Uh, not everyone um, likes it. <laughs> uh, and there's no reason why one is obliged to. But uh, one of uh, Francis's uh, traits is that he's extremely opinionated. And uh, in the course of uh, his survey of culture and civilization, um, he'll uh, really express uh, very harsh criticism sometimes. I, I already mentioned, but here are some of, let's see. Here's what he himself says about that. Um, he says, this is in the um, preface to the book. If I had been born in another time or place, I would have only sung his praise. Analysis and comment would never have occurred to me, they being foreign to art, except when, after becoming a real artist, one by choice becomes a teacher. But being born when I was, and having lived my life in a portion of the world in which all utterance is contaminated by self-interest, Avoidance of comment is impossible. I ask the reader to allow that although some of this comment may seem harsh, it is directed at conditions rather than at persons. It is personal only to the extent that persons are identified with conditions. The world of false values that I attack and that I myself, my own condition, is the target it has hit before it touches anyone else myself being the world of false values, because it is myself who, by having turned away from the eternal truths, from the virtue of man, created false values. But I hope my comment will sometimes be entertaining. And I certainly find it to be that myself. So here, are like, uh, at the end of uh, book five, the first part, he starts going through the last... 500 years in literary art, visual art, and music. So I'm going to read a little bit just to give you a sense of the <laughs> a flavor of some of this. Okay, this is what can be salvaged from the last 500 years of poetry and literature. <coughs> Since Dante and Chaucer, and he's, uh, as I mentioned, already taken Dante to the shed a couple of times and quite thoroughly thrashed him. A handful of work of Shakespeare, subtracting what he said, from what he was paid to say. In other words, Shakespeare was okay when he wasn't selling out, right? From Burns, a poesy. From Rambo, a sentence in search of a master. From Nietzsche and Whitman, two pages each, one for themselves, one for God. Bloch and Mayakovsky, two voices looking for a piano. I'm going to just jump a little bit. From Gabriela Misral, five candles on a platter of an arty. From Pound, Harmony on a lute played with a rifle trigger, and sometimes almost making music. From Charles Chaplin, a rose growing out of a violin. The rest, yoking words into yawns, snapping them with damp fingers. So much for the last 500 years of literature. When he uh, goes through, um, okay, here's a little bit of art. And by the way, Francis himself had been painter. He was associated um, in his uh, 30s with the artistic movement in Australia that was uh, uh, in, that involved the, the leading um, artists of that time. In fact, probably the most famous school of Australian poetry of uh, painting and art in the 20th century. He was an intimate part of the group. So he knew, he knew what he was talking about. So here he goes through a few things um, from Cezanne and Brank, from Jean, Juan Gris and Chagall, etc., etc. The rest, not up to the hawks, painting their eyelids pink and green. <laughs> this is modern art, right? So he, he'll say very uh, harsh and opinionated things like this. And at the end of it, surely a niggardly total, five drops of milk strained out of five million buckets of blood. The night the night, strong steel and hard concrete, and our hearts, deserts of spent foam, a wind and a rain of fire. Okay, now here's, when one is 
uh, engaging this aspect of stay with God. You know, the um, very severe critique to which he subjects um, many famous historical figures and great artists. I would have these thoughts about it. It's the point, I don't think anyone is under any expectation to accept Francis's opinions on all these things. Um, that really isn't the point. But what I do really feel uh, is the point of view from which he's coming um, is very deeply insightful. Like, let me take the case of Shakespeare, just because I'm, I know Shakespeare well and have great admiration for the guy. Okay. He said, you know, a handful of work from Shakespeare, subtracting what he said from what he was paid to say. Okay, in other words, well, I do know what he's talking about. Um, and this has been a criticism that Shakespeare got, that uh, Shakespeare didn't really have a world view very much that he was uh, uh, advancing. He kind of accepted the world view of his age to a large extent, and within that context was giving a, his life plays, these life scenes uh, acting themselves out. And what Francis would say about that time is that the whole civilization had done this. Uh, the civilization was turning away from God. It began at that time. He has a lot of comments about the Renaissance in that respect. Now, without any personal disparagement of Shakespeare, that is true, in fact. It, I mean, whether um, whatever one thinks about a lot of these individual people, I think that many people nowadays would agree that our civilization has turned away from God. Wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, God has really been pushed out. Um, and when you look at the spectacle of the world nowadays, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're living, we're not living on divine values uh, in the main part. And you could ask the question, well, how has that happened? How has that happened? Well, Stay With God is looking at many ideas, attitudes, values, and looking at how God got pushed out of the picture and what is entailed in retruing civilization and on its real foundation. The title, Stay With God, was given to him by Baba. And that really is the work of the book. What do we do to make our civilization, our culture, and our values founded on God and stay with God? So if you read it in that way, and don't worry about whether you agree with the opinion or not. If it, some people don't care. I personally find it to be quite a bit of fun. Uh, but if you don't, I would suggest don't worry about that part of it, but look at the point he's making. He's always got a very deep and insightful point, and he's got a very keen eye for what he's talking about. So sometimes when you're dealing with a great spiritual figure like that, you know, a person might, you know, be very irascible, or if you're a Zen, under a Zen thing, he'll give you a thrash with his switch. Or, In other words, you have to deal with a lot of that. Well, it's worth it with Francis because you're going to get a tremendous inner education. Anyway, that's uh, some of my feeling about it. For, here's uh, This passage uh, illustrates some of this. He takes Dante to task. And uh, Beethoven, too, as a matter of fact. Um, so let me read this. This gives an idea, I think, the inner point he's trying to make. The greatness of, you see, with Dante, have any of you ever read Dante? Divine Comedy. It's uh, one of the supreme works of literature, and it, it's a vision. Dante uh, it goes on a journey through hell, purgatory, and paradise. Um, and he sees all the layers, the borges, and hell and the torments of the souls there and so forth. Well, Francis um, was, uh, didn't like it. Didn't like it that Dante was pretending to have known things that he couldn't have known and pretending to be a prophet when he was not one. Like he put the prophet Muhammad being, enduring the tortures of hell, for example, that Francis didn't care for. That aspect of he didn't like. Okay, the greatness of Dante was not in his vision of the three worlds, but in his experience of Beatrice. Beatrice was the divine, was the beloved in Dante's poetry. 
and she consistently appears. And some of the most beautiful love poetry ever written was written by him to Beatrice. That's the element in it that Francis likes. The greatness of Beethoven was not in his symphonic embracements, but in the quartet and piano communings with his beloved. When love approaches a man, he becomes silent, except for thou. From thou rises millions of words or notes, which he weaves into patterns pleasing to his beloved's ear. This is what art is about. The world now knows not this art. There is a way which the masters proclaim, which the saints enjoy, in which the artist with the industry of a child plays and prattles the beginnings of love speech. As he grows older, his father sends him out into the world of the way where he becomes a hero and gives him work to do by which he becomes an artist of self. And by art, Francis means much something much more than um, the narrow sense of art uh, we would usually uh, associate with it. What Francis really means is bringing higher values into expression in life. And in that sense, everyone is an artist. He very clearly means that. Let me read you. Um, this is the beginning of Book 5 of Stay With God. Once men sang purely in the work of their hands, in the speech of their mouths. They knew that Avatar and the perfect masters were the only God on the earth, and that saints were the doors to him. By God, men lived and his name wrought their works. They went not out to labor, nor sat down to meet, without song attending. The leftover scraps of their singing we have gathered into our galleries and libraries to worship or stare at. <laughs> the caustic element coming in there. So it's like when you sit down and eat your food, that's art. Or when you're working with your hands, um, you know, repairing a car, or doing physical labor, or whatever it is you do, that's art. Art is all these things, not just gawking at a painting in a gallery. So, after Zarathustra, that would be Zoroaster, the light purely again in men's eyes, brightly between lovers and above the marriage bed, in conversation and contract. These things are art. Just conversation, married life, making business dealings. After Abraham, the settled life in obedience to God's voice. Consequently, friendship between men. Who had what to hear, fear from whom? The tent, the, the tent pitched or struck at his word. I do not bow down before that which rises and sets. After the wanderings of Rama and Sita and Lakshman, pure dignity of women established, and brotherliness without jealousy, and so forth. I don't have the rest of that. Here's another uh, short passage on this. Learned men, able to read hearts, and the signs of God, and the wind, and the fire, and the green earth, capable of writing the word love into the work of their hands, their swordsmanship and plowing, their pots, in which they drew water and cooked their food and offered sacrifice to God. This is all art. Art is bringing the love and higher truth and divinity and making it concrete through whatever it is that you do. You know, at the very end of Stay With God, there's a magnificent line um, on this. He says, Stay with God in whatever shape he shapes you and work your works within the boundaries of that shape. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read that again. Stay with God in whatever shape he shapes you and work your works within the boundaries of that shape. That's art. Whatever you are, whatever your talents are, whatever your work is, whatever your aptitudes are, stay there and work your the expressions of love within that, your own life as a medium. That is art. So in this retruing of culture and art, he's actually talking about the lives 
that everyone lives. You know, I was always in part of the literary artistic scene, and uh, as you know, until I moved to India, and um, I found it a bit off-putting the way that um, artistic people often would be inclined uh, to think they're a bit better than everybody else. It's, I know somebody would read a poem and they'd say, well, when I wrote this poem, I was feeling this and thinking this. And after a 20-minute introduction, you get this poem that nobody would want to listen to anyway. At least that's what I felt. And it's sort of like, well, I don't really care very much about you. I mean, <laughs> to be heartless, why are you so much more important than me? If you have something universal to say, say it, you know. Well, that kind of aloof, snobby idea of art is completely rejected by Francis, where it is really the art of living that he wants to talk about. So, um, okay, here's coming then to uh, a bit of his, Francis's life. Uh, we had a play on it. Let me see that was uh, uh, performed in um, Miranda. Any of you go to that? Rosie, you were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it is. <coughs> Ralph and Michaeline wrote it, and they had... Oh, yeah, Carol, you're right. You were there, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, he was um, born in 1907. And let's see. He was actually, uh, this is a, this is a uh, poem of his that's actually kind of a impressionistic poetic autobiography. It's out of print right now, unfortunately, but I find it to be really quite beautiful. But it gives a feeling uh, for all of this. He was actually born in London in 1907. And his uh, parents were, were you know, very well educated. I think his father was a Fabian uh, into William Morris, you know, very with a lot of cultural, literary, you know, progressive interests, that, that kind of a thing. And when he was five, the whole family moved to uh, Australia. I think his parents had the idea of returning to a simple way of life and, uh, uh, you know, farming and all of that. Uh, and one of the things that they did discover was that uh, farming is not easy. I don't know if any of you have ever done it. I never have. Uh, and it was very hard to make a go of it. They really didn't know a thing about it. But they bought some property down in South Australia, um, Victoria. Uh, the largest city in that general neighborhood is um, Melbourne, although they were definitely out in the country. But they, uh, he grew up as a farm boy, plowing the fields, trying to make their crops. Yeah, good to see ya. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, he got very little formal education. It was like a little town, Glen Dower, I think it was the name of it. And uh, uh, he, there'd be like a one room, uh, one classroom school, and he... Uh, got uh, schooling up to about the age of maybe 12 or so, and then that was it. Um, and then he had to leave and work on the farm, and uh, his f father was kind of, um, one gets the impression, uh, not in all ways the most practical man who ever lived, and he, to try to support the family, he would uh, sell insurance, so he was often away from home. And when they were about 12, uh, his father left the farm and moved to uh, Melbourne to open a bookstore. So the kids were actually left there alone uh, maintaining the farm, a second-hand bookstore. And uh, they struggled on for a couple of years doing that. And uh, they were afflicted by rabbits and afflicted by drought. And finally, uh, it just became impossible. And they wound up selling the farm. And I think they came away with about five pounds each. Here are some pictures of Francis, and I wanted to read a little bit of his description. So that's a really important part of who Francis Brabazon is. He grew up in a very rural center setting and was a very hard physical work 
was the, what he knew as a kid. And I understand that when the, uh, you know, my generation showed up, I, I wasn't among them, but Avatars of Odin in the early 70s, uh, you had to work. Half the day was spent in hard physical work on Avatars of Odin. Have any of you ever been to um, Mayor House in uh, Sydney? Anybody have been there? Any of you ever been to Avatar's Abode? Okay, Sam, Sam has been. Yeah, um, Mayor House <coughs> is where Baba visited in 1956. Bill Page and his family were living there at the time. And it's a stone house which Francis built with his own hands. He learned the art of stonemasonry in order to build that house. So, uh, I guess you'd say poverty, like low, middle class, farmer, rural, rural kind of poverty, was in his background and very hard physical work from the very beginning. Here are some photos I got of him. Here are his parents. This is his dad, Percy, and his mom, Florence. And here's Francis. Hey, his little baby. Huh? Somehow when I look at Francis, it's sort of, I'd not be fully convinced that he ever was a baby, but here he is. <laughs> Looking quite cute. Here he is again as a toddler. Here is with his, um, Francis is on the far right here. And he had two older brothers. And we jump now. Uh, later on, he became, uh, he was really physically very strong. At one point, he held the um, unofficial Australian record in weightlifting for a certain, for a certain move, whatever it is you can call it in weightlifting. So he was physically a really, really tough guy. Okay. Now, this is how he describes some of this in uh, The Wind of the Word which is, as I say, a, a poetic... I'd like to read a little bit of this. I think it's really quite moving. He begins with how he first encountered the feeling of God's presence, which he calls the wind of the word. <clears throat> okay. I first met it out on the plains. It rushed in from the further west, covering the sun, and shrouding the trees, with fallout from the atomic interior. And the trees marched back over the horizon, and it raced on. I went with it, for it was the wind's time to explore all places, sound all things that would sound, seeking a throat through which it could utter a song locked in a continent since the first dreaming. That would be the continent of Australia. Right. He was expressing that in Australia, the continent, the land itself, was searching for a voice um, of this new advent. It hadn't found you know, the existing culture, was not expressing what was in the soul of the place. It strode with great strides like an obsession, it slid like a hand, long starved of women. It drummed on the iron ropes of homesteads, and dinned on the tin ropes of shacks. It seethed around the shiny filling stations of petrol and beer, and whistled over the graveyards of cans, old cars, and bedsteads, and went on. It reared up over the coastal range like a thousand unbroken horses. There's a coastal range in eastern Australia, pretty well going over a lot of the, the length of it. A um, couple thousand, two, three thousand feet high, something like that. And the, the eastern part of it, because of that range, gets some rain. And when you get to the inland, you're in the outback, which is very arid. It reared up over the coastal range like a thousand unbroken horses and hurtled down like a field of Grand Prix cars out of control, tearing up trees, ripping down telephone lines and lost itself for a while among the banging doors and rattling windows in the suburbs of the city. 